Coming up on show 589, the first Chinese Tesla Model 3, Volkswagen's pilot battery program, and a new cheap-ish electric bike. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily, Monday, 23rd of September edition. My name is Martin Lee, going through every EV story that I can find on the internets and whittling them down. To save you time, really, thank you to myev.com for helping me make this show. I was chatting to one of my friends at myev on LinkedIn yesterday, and he was saying we got some very, very exciting news that I can't tell you about, but it's coming very soon. Uh, oh, I can't wait to hear what it is. But in the meantime, if you're in the USA, check out myev.com if you're buying and selling and learning about used EVs. Well, a photo that was leaked and posted online by the Twitter user Vincent. He is a Tesla tweeter extraordinaire. Today, September 23rd, shows a white Model 3 on the assembly line at uh, Tesla's Gigafactory 3 in uh, Nanjing, Shanghai, China. A previous tweet by Vincent claimed that some people who have ordered a Model 3 in China have actually started receiving tutorials about the operation of their cars. Now, usually those tutorials start to get sent out four to six weeks before delivery of a car taking place at Tesla, according to Steve Hanley, who penned this one for Clean Technica. Well, according to Interesting Engineering, the leaked photo was attributed to a Weibo user who is the chief auto editor of Tencent Auto. Tencent is a giant Chinese tech firm that owns about 5% of Tesla. So we're joining a few dots up here. Maybe we're doing two and two equals five, but it's looking good. It's looking quite reliable as a source. A subsequent tweet by the user Vincent said that the rumor was that estimating uh, the first group of made in China Model 3s will be in customers' hands and driveways and garages sometime November, even if that is 30th of November, that is still a stunning achievement. I must admit personally, when I see when I when they were building the Gigafactory 3, you saw the shell go up, the roof go on, what was a field then became a factory, and then shots of the inside, and, and it seemed so unreal that I couldn't really comprehend the fact that what was just a field, you know, of mud a few short months ago, could well be making some of the world's most high-tech cars way before the end of the year. It just didn't compute. It sort of seemed otherworldly, like, well, I'm reading this, but I don't quite believe it. But I'm starting to think maybe I should believe it. Maybe I've got a little healthy dose of scepticism in there as well, but... Man, if they get to pull it off, that is an amazing achievement. Well done to all the Chinese Tesla team who are working on that project. Oh, by the way, if you're new to the podcast, why do they need to do that? In order to avoid import tariffs, which are uh, pretty sizable on cars. If you can make the cars in China, even if you can do just enough for it to be classified as made in China, even if the batteries are made somewhere else and shipped in, you put the car together, you do just enough to be made in China, you avoid those import tariffs, you sell cars at a much cheaper price, and more people buy the cars. Well, talking about battery production, the Volkswagen Northvolt Corporation is taking off as they launch a first pilot production for battery cells at Volkswagen's Salzgitter plant, or Salzgitter plant. Uh, production is to scale up to 16 gigawatt hours, but that is four years away. Volkswagen is investing a billion euros in the plant, according to Electrive. Well, Volkswagen's aiming to independently produce its own battery cells in a joint venture with Northvolt, rather than having to rely on battery systems from external supplies. At the Salzgitter plants in Germany, where TDI and TSI engines currently roll off the assembly line, they have what's called a center of excellence, a COE. Already established with 300 employees in the initial batch, they say in a translation into English from an original German article that Electrive has done here. Volkswagen today just opened a pilot production facility. So this isn't mass production of cells. This is a pilot production facility as part of their center of excellence, they're going to be testing, developing small series production of battery cells. For Frank Blome, who is the head of COE for battery cells, the pilot plant, he says, is a very important step on our way to building the Gigafactory. So this isn't the Gigafactory being built yet, but it's the first 300 people with Volkswagen and Northvolt on an R&D facility on their way to their Gigafactory. And on the way to that 16 gigawatt hours of production by 2023, 
Well, from cars to bikes, and funnily enough, it all ties in with this week's question of the week. I was asking you, well, I am asking you this week, what you want to hear on this podcast. Is it just about cars? Is it about other things as well? I'm I'm kind of into electric scooters and electric bikes. I'd like to do an electric bike conversion uh, sometime, maybe even this year if I get any chance. I thought I was going to do it over the summer, but I'd had the craziest of years. And so... I, you know, I barely got time to catch your breath. But if I get five minutes of the weekend, I'd like to buy a kind of Chinese hub motor and battery package from eBay, wait a couple of weeks, it'll turn up and put it on my wife's bike and kind of do a bike conversion. I'd like to do that. Well, if you don't fancy doing that, you could just spend $1,000 on a new hipster spec electric bike from Swagtron. I was delighted when Mike Atoll, one of my favorite YouTubers, showed up as writing for Electric because it was like two of my favorite blogs and kind of crashing together. Swagtron's new EB12 electric bicycle is the first foray into full-sized commuter bikes from Swagtron. And while they didn't quite hit the ball out of the park on their first try, they did get it pretty darn close with a sleek design and an electric boost. The Swagtron EB12 could be the perfect option for cash-strapped students or budget-minded commuters in the city that want a good bike for an even better price, says Micah at Electric. Well, Swagtron, yeah, Swagtron's known for building affordable electric bicycles. Their playbook isn't just to pump out real cheapo stuff like other budget companies. They cut out the stuff you don't really need and therefore the bits they're left with. They can put okay quality into that. No one expects the Swagtron e-bike to get passed down through the generations, but they do expect a decent quality bike for a very low price, and that's exactly what Swagtron has done yet again with the EB12 electric bicycle. It's a hardy commuter e-bike that offers exactly zero fancy features, says Micah, other than it will get you where you are going. And with electric power, we like that. So many journeys could be done with an electric bike. I know that my... You know, do you do a grocery top-up? We do a big shop, We and sometimes we get it delivered, but we do the big shop. Now, the big shop for us takes about an hour. We walk around the supermarket. We get all our staples. Then a couple of times a week, we do a top-up, and that's your pints of milk and your bread and your fresh fruit and veg and, and bits that either we forgot or well, <laughs> that take our fancy or that we want to add. And so we have to drive to do our big shop, but that's okay. We're doing it on a, we, we do it in the EV. But my top-up shop is about it's about a 16 to 18 minute walk. And I've got to be honest, if I'm in a hurry, I will drive the car. And yeah, I'm driving an electric car to do my top-up shop just to get a pint of milk and some essentials. But, you know, that journey I should be doing on a bike, really. So a couple of things. Actually, if it was an e-bike and I was feeling really lazy, I would definitely take the bike if it was handy, you know, because at the minute my bike is, or both our bikes are kind of buried in the summer house at the bottom of the garden, and if I had it in the garage, maybe on the wall, or just handy, ready to go, and I could just jump on, and it's charged, and what that would be like a three or four minute bike ride, maybe a, uh, it'd be even quicker possibly on an e-bike. I know that in my life I have journeys that I should be doing on a bike, or I can't say an electric scooter because we're not allowed to ride electric scooters on the road or the pavement, but I hope legislation fixes that soon. However, an electric bike, I really should be changing some of my electric car journeys into electric bike journeys. Well, Fiat Chrysler is going to test vehicle to grid operations, an experimental fleet of 700 EVs and test vehicles to work out what V2G is all about in the world of Fiat Chrysler. It's going to allow power grids to use energy stored in their car batteries to face demand during peak hours. Says a Reuters report, Fiat Chrysler is taking its first steps into electric mobility as the Italian-American car maker moves on from its failed $35 $35 billion bid to merge with France's Renault, a pioneer in electric vehicles. FCA, according to this Reuters report, on Thursday last week signed the agreement with the national grid operator in Italy. They're called Turner, T-E-R-N-A, Turner, uh, to jointly test technology about vehicle to grid. Uh, the project will include a feasibility study to begin with to launch an experimental demonstration and a fleet of cars connected to the grid, V2G infrastructure, uh, to be built at their Mira Farini part. Uh, plant in Turin and it'd be interesting if I dig a little bit deeper into this story I'll work out what cars they're doing and how they're doing it and what tech they're doing it because at the minute you know Chadamo is the natural choice on uh, Nissan's 
for vehicle to grid, but you can, you know, you can do it with uh, with other connectors if you are building them to spec. So as, as prototype or test vehicles, I'll look into that. Well, company car drivers, fleet managers, uh, need a simple way of charging EVs. Uh, you must admit, and I will admit, that electric vehicle charging is perhaps one of the more stickier situations, unless you own a Tesla. However, now a new roaming partnership between New Motion and ChargePoint, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure providers, they've announced a roaming partnership that will allow fleet drivers access to both networks, according to Fleet News today. Uh, by the end of the year, New Motion and ChargePoint customers can access each network without needing to create a new account. Well, Sitzi uh, Zudema, I think he's the CEO of New Motion, uh, said this, and I quote, this partnership is a big step forward for the UK's public charging network, and we hope to see a positive effect on the ease of use by EV drivers. We are pleased to offer our UK drivers additional access to ChargePoint and their network that includes a good few hundred rapid chargers. With this, we're able to expand our European network that includes over 118,000 charge points. And I'll pop a link to Fleet News in the show notes. The only new motion chargers that I ha- that I come across in my semi-regular EV adventures is... In a city called Southampton, in the south, funnily enough, of England, about 25, 30 minutes from where I live, they have an Ikea there. So as you can imagine, we spend the odd few hours wandering around Ikea, following the arrows on the floor, and just watching young couples argue. And there's a a set of eight new motion chargers near Ikea, and they are terrible for reliability. A few times I've been there, and a couple have worked. I went once and just one of them was working. The last few times I've been, they've all been off. The whole bank has been off. Literally, it's not as if... Because before I was having trouble with the new motion chargers to get them to handshake with the Renault Zoe. And they're 22 kilowatt chargers. And the, and my Renault Zoe charges at 22 kilowatts on the AC. They are, for me, the perfect chargers. <laughs> and they're free because they're in a car park that you have to pay quite a lot of money to use the car park. So I get it. It's subsidized by the car park operator. But honestly, it's a waste of time me having a new motion fob because they're just terrible. I've called... I've sent bug reports or whatever it's called, like fault reports. I never get an acknowledgement of anything back. And it's just, they might as well just take them out. But it's been so long now. They are just terrible. I, You know, sometimes when you file a report or you file, you know, you get onto these charge operators and say, hey, I had a problem. Even an acknowledgement would be nice. But when you don't hear back, that just rings alarm bells for me. And I'm sure there's no problems at New, New Motion, but... It's firstly, and this happens as well with, what's the other one that I've reported a few times? And it, it just took one of the listeners to the podcast. Oh, Podpoint. Like one of the, somebody at Podpoint listens to this podcast and he DM me on Twitter to be like, look, I heard you talking about it. We'll look into this. But whenever I've put a report into Podpoint, say, hey, this is running very slowly. I'm, you know, it's a, it's a 22 kilowatt post. And I'm getting one or two kilowatts and, uh, or even it's completely out of order. You get nothing back. Now, what do you think? Is that a good or a bad thing? I think you should at least get an acknowledgement. You should at least either get a pop-up on screen or you should get something to say, hey, Martin, thank you very much for reporting this. Like, just an email or like a text or something to be like, hey, we're going to look into it. But you hit the button and you can like, on the app and has it gone through? Anyway, back to my new motion ones. It's a real shame. I've given up on them. I have no hope that I turn up again. Next time we go to Ikea, I, I will turn up and... Will they work? I'm not expecting them to. I'll be delighted if somebody has gone into the electric room and just flicked them on again. I imagine the whole bank has just, because there's eight of them, I imagine the the whole bank of them's tripped out or the trip switch has gone. Um, I even, and this is slightly sad, I even followed the ducting around the car park because it was, you could see where the, 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 the new silver ducting from when they put it in was a different colour to all the other lights and stuff. And I even followed the power supply until it went off into a, like a plant room and I'm like, oh man, <laughs> so they just need to flick the switch and turn them back on. Anyway, let's talk about our question of the week this week. Thanks to myev.com. What do you want to hear on this podcast? Do you want me to only talk about pure electric cars? Do you want to hear about hybrids or plug-in hybrids? What about other vehicles like bikes and scooters and planes and boats? Let me know. You can email me. My address is hello at evnewsdaily.com. Leave a comment on Facebook and YouTube. 
There are 253 patrons of the podcast, and your generosity keeps me going. Thank you very much. Hopefully we get to entertain and inform thousands of people all around the world now. And if you want to get any of the previous 588 shows, they're all in the archive. The new ones come at you first and free and automatically if you are a podcast subscriber. Catch me on the socials by searching EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid. Mm-hmm.